Does that include jokes about the fur coat? This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with the salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of over $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Adventures in Angular link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hire to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hire.com slash Adventures in Angular. Does your team need to master AngularJS? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to ours, angularbootcamp.com. This episode is sponsored by Widgmo 5, a brand new generation of JavaScript controls. A pretty amazing line of HTML5 and JavaScript products for enterprise application development in that Widgmo 5 leverages ECMAScript 5 and each control ships with AngularJS directives. Check out the faster, lighter, and more mobile Widgmo 5. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid-state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code RubyRogues, you'll get a $10 credit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 44 of the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel, we have John Papa. Hey, everybody. Lucas Rubelke. Hello, everyone. Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. Is Katya there with you? She is not yet. She will be. And I just apologize in advance for my terrible chest cold. (laughs) All right. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. We've got two special guests. We've got Chris, is it? Dias? Dias. Dias. And Eric Gamma. Hello. Do you gentlemen want to introduce yourselves really quickly? So my name's Chris Dias. I am a program manager on the Visual Studio Code team. And so now I'm not allowed to use more words than you did, right, Chris? <laughs> no, you should use more words than you. So uh, I'm Eric Gamma. I am a distinguished engineer. I'm running a team in Zurich. A small lab, V8 developers, and we worked on this thing we will talk about, Visual Studio Code. And I joined Microsoft four years ago, and before that, I did other things like Eclipse, JUnit, Patterns, stuff like that. That was a lot more. I could go a little bit more of my background. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I've been at Microsoft for 21 years. I've worked on developer tools almost the entire time. So everything from answering the phones on Visual Basic 2 and 3 to shipping .NET frameworks, languages, and for the past few years on this project, which also has different flavors. If you think of Monaco for Azure websites or VS Online for Azure websites and the the Monaco editor, all part of this project. And uh, I'm in Redmond. And as Eric said, the engineering team is mostly in Zurich. Very cool. So Visual Studio Code, do you want to kind of give us an overview of what that is? Maybe how it's different from Visual Studio, the studio? Yeah. So Visual Studio Code is a a new lightweight code editor. Call it redefining what the code editor is. If you think on a a spectrum of editors and IDEs, editors on one end just being your regular text editor, Notepad++, Sublime, things like that, and uh, IDEs like Visual Studio or WebStorm or Eclipse, on the other end, Visual Studio Code falls along that line much closer to the editor end of the spectrum. So it is a uh, lightweight editor, but it adds a couple things that really enhance the end development experience. We call it the core inner loop, which is a great IntelliSense or code editing and understanding experience and uh, debugging. So great editor out of the box, but with some of the key things that you need day to day for development that typically are only available in bigger IDEs. And it is Microsoft's first cross-platform uh, development tool. Maybe one thing I would add, right, in addition to what Chris said, uh, if you look at IDEs, they have lots of good stuff in there, like intelligence debugging, but they have also do other things, like almost for each framework that exists, they integrate it and so on. And we code it, it 
different approach. We really only took the inner loop stuff, functions from the ID, but we also say it's okay to do things on the command line, right? So it's not everything that you do, like publish to a website, needs to have a button in the shell or the tool, right? So that's kind of, we respect and honor also the command line. And that's a way to keep, be more on the editor end of the spectrum and not on the ID end of the spectrum. We work well with an opinionated workflow. So if you've got a workflow that you've got, then Visual Studio Code should fit into that and not cause you to change the way that you work, but enhance it. Yeah, the way I, way I like to look at it is, you know, in Visual Studio or specifically in an IDE, there is a very opinionated way that you should do things. And lots of things are buttons, clicks, is very mouse heavy, and everything plugs into a certain predefined workflow. Whereas it makes it more difficult to plug into, you know, how pretty much any developer you pick up off the street would want to do their workflow. Whereas an editor, like Sublime, the, the canonical example, you can do whatever you want. You're reliant on your own tools. You could use an editor and a terminal and a browser and, you know, fighter and things to work together. I think that's where Visual Studio Code falls more on that side, where everything is keyboard heavy. You can pretty much say, I want to work this way or that way and define your own workflow and your own tasks. So... It's not that, again, one is better than the other so much it is. It kind of is if you want a more tailored workflow to the way you work, I kind of like how Visual Studio Code works or code. One of the things I think that's cool along this lines, though, that separates it from the editors, and I'm hoping you guys can comment a little bit about your ideas on this, is that there's often, let's suppose you shell out to a terminal or a console and you're doing your command line thing. There's often information that's displayed in that console that could really improve the developer experience if it flowed back in. I often find that Visual Studio Code can do that, and I wonder if you guys can comment upon that as a principle and what special things you do for that. You mean the additional information we give it kind of in context that is kind of in the inner loop that comes from still external tools like Git? You know, what are your outgoing changes? What are the incoming changes? That's just one uh, example, but errors, that's a great right? example, errors. Yeah. And I can imagine that I might have my own tool that will be spitting things out, and some of that material that comes out would be useful to flow back into uh, VS Code in a way that somebody returning to VS Code could like click on something and see it jump there. So one area where we want to really do that, because you have these tools that produce output like errors, but you really like to see them in your tool because you want to quickly navigate the errors, right? You want to jump to them. So what you have built is a lightweight integration of task running so that you can define a task that does something and then you give us some additional meta information about the task that allows us to integrate the output from the tool from this external tool into the editor. So that's what we call task running support, right? So for instance, you can define a regular expression that extracts the error information, and we can then present that to you in the tool again, in this inner loop where you develop. So that's definitely one of the design points we have. Be open, allow things to run outside, but pull the stuff into the editor that you want to have at your fingertips to improve your navigation and understanding. Yeah, well, that's really great because I don't have to then go look in the output, find that it's line 58, go back into the ID, do a go-to and find 58. I can just see it there and bang, I'm at it. Yep. We talked about before we want to fit into existing workflows. We don't want to make you have to rewrite your gulp tasks, but we want to be able to surface just the right amount of information to make you more productive, which is why we have this task running system that basically says, hey, Here's your existing set of tasks. Just tell us what the regular expression is, and then we'll do the rest of the, the heavy lifting to add that thing that you don't normally get, but what you need in sort of that core inner loop. If I've heard you correctly, that where this kind of plays in is something we've tried was having the TypeScript lint our code through a task, and then code effectively uses a regular expression to pull out the different errors or warnings and then toss them in code's errors and warnings palette. Is that correct? Yep. Yep, exactly. I want to interject here really quickly and just point out, I don't know if this came up. I might have missed it because I was playing with code on my machine. And it runs on OS X, Linux, and Windows. So anyone who tuned out because they were like, oh, it's Microsoft, it'll only work on Windows, it's not the case. Yeah, we almost fact, forgot. We almost forgot, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and in fact, that's the biggest reason I was pushing towards this Uh I got to admit, I have not used code for more than five minutes on Windows. Since I've been playing with this, all I've been using it on is OS X on my Mac. And it's been my de facto 
editor for the last several weeks. So it, it's been phenomenal for me. Are there holes in it still? I still think there's a few gaps that need to be improved. But to me, it's been an amazing cross-plat story. The Sorry. other angle on this that I want to talk a little bit about is that when I install IDEs like Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code, but Visual Studio or, you know, some of the JetBrains ones like IntelliJ or RubyMine, they just, in a lot of ways, seem like they're overwhelming. And this is a really, really simple interface. So is this a completely different product? And if so, why did you name it Visual Studio? So it is a completely different product from Visual Studio itself. But we named it Visual Studio Code to keep it in the Visual Studio family of tools. Visual Studio itself has a, a very high satisfaction rating amongst developers. And we just say, hey, you know, what's a great tool? It's Visual Studio is always sort of very favorable. And when you ask people, hey, you know, what is it about Visual Studio? And a lot of things that people say are, it's, you know, great IntelliSense, great debugging experiences. And so what we're trying to do with Visual Studio Code is to sort of expand the footprint of where we have developer tools offerings and cross-platform and fit into or, you know, have an offering in this space where Visual Studio doesn't exist today. So by putting it under the Visual Studio brand, we get the umbrella of Visual Studio, which is all the goodness of that. We get the you know, sort of, hey, the knee-jerk reaction, the franchise features of Visual Studio, which IntelliSense and debugging surface themselves in Visual Studio code. But it, it is a completely different product. But I like the point you made. Now, the franchise should be very similar, right? The strong points of Visual Studio on the desktop we want to bring into Visual Studio code. Forget the franchise issue for a second and whether that's a great name everywhere. But one of the challenges that you've set for yourself is how to search for information about code, Visual Studio Code, and that includes within user voice and everything else, and not run into all of the user voice and problem sets and solutions and so forth that relate to Visual Studio proper as opposed to Visual Studio Code. And you can't search for the word code very well because that delivers everything. So it's been... It's been a bit of a challenge to filter out the things that filter to the things that are Visual Studio Code specific. And are you guys doing anything to address that or are we just going to suffer out here? Yeah, we recognize the searchability problems with the name. But as we build up more content, because there's, there's not a lot of things to actually go out and search for. But as we build up more content and do more stuff, we're actually working very hard to do you know, search engine optimizations and things like that to make it so that this information will bubble up when necessary. It's a known problem, but it's a it's a trade off we're trying to to balance. Hey, at least you didn't name okay. a programming language Go. <laughs> or Go yeah. to yeah. But no, but I think we now track the whole feedback since almost a week or more than a week. And I must say, I had the same fear. What I found with the new social media, now you have a Twitter hashtag, you have a Twitter account name. If someone blogs about it, there is also a tweet using the hashtag VS Code and so on. So for us didn't work as badly as I expected, right? So we found the blocks because there's a corresponding tweet about them. And see, my, my whole team, we obviously everything in the whole team, we're all coders, we're all testers, now we're all feedback trackers. And so far, it went pretty okay. And I think part of that, that reason, Eric, is that a lot of, so this was announced, what, last week at Build? Was it last week? Week before? Week and a half ago, yeah. Yeah, in San Francisco. And things went well there, but again, the audience for that is obviously very Microsoft-focused. Which I think why, you know, Visual Studio Code is much more a familiar term with them, but it also brings up the same question that I've heard a lot, even from the Microsoft crowd of, so the Microsoft crowd saying, wait a minute, is this Visual Studio on a Mac? Which I'll let you guys address. And then the non-Microsoft crowd is like, wait a minute, it's Visual Studio, should I even be looking at this? And I think Lucas had a similar question that kind of goes along with this, and I'll defer to him to kind of drive into that. Thanks, John. So the question I have is being involved with kind of the open source community is putting out a tool like this is kind of, it's going to, it's outside of the, I think the picture that people stereotypically paint of Microsoft. And so if I may ask, philosophically, what was the driving factors behind releasing a cross-platform tool? It was just a logical step, right? Given all the cross-platform of um, ASP.NET, right? Of core CLR, it's the logical step. Did you also want to pair the libraries with the tool so that you can develop with the libraries on every platform and have a great development experience, right? That was a logical follow-up of open sourcing and making all the other technologies like Roslyn available cross-platform and so on. And so how much resistance, I mean, do you guys foresee having within, you know, a community that traditionally is just kind of seen, you know, Microsoft in kind of this closed 
Like you have to delve into their ecosystem, which I think when you're in the ecosystem, it's really nice. But, you know, now it's like, hey, we're kind of a totally different thing here. Check it out. What are your thoughts about actually reaching out to a community that, you know, traditionally, you know, may not actually even consider, you know, Microsoft tooling is, is a viable thing. And all of a sudden now you've put this amazing tool chain kind of in their laps. Well, I, I think that's one of the key things that we have to go and do. But until we had this tool, we had no way to go talk to anybody outside of our ecosystem. We asked, we had, hey, you know, you could do .NET cross-platform, but we don't give you any tools or any way to actually do it. And we saw, you know, huge interest in the open sourcing and cross-platform of .NET. You know, it's like third, I think, in Hacker News of all time. But we had no way to talk to developers or go out and continue with that story until we had something that was a cross-platform tool. So now that we have that, we can go and talk to the Python crowd, the PHP crowd, anybody, you know, that is doing stuff that is not traditionally on the Microsoft platform or in Visual Studio itself. Now we have some way to talk to you and offer up something that is of value that, you know, you may have heard about some good things in the Microsoft Visual Studio world, but you can't use it or, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's big, it's heavy, I don't want to use it. But now we can provide you these cool tools. And that's kind of part of the motivation behind what we're doing. As Eric said, you know, it was a natural evolution, but you know, in order to talk to these people, you need something to talk to them with. You know, and Chris, something that I really am grateful for that you guys went down this road on is for years, obviously, I came from Microsoft World. I was spoiled with all the wonderful tools that Microsoft had. And when you're working at .NET, you live it and you kind of take for granted. But when I moved over to doing full-time open source and pretty much moving off the .NET stack a couple of years ago, the first thing I realized is that, wow, there's really a dearth of great tooling out there. There's, you know, I tried WebStorm, IntelliJ, Brackets, Sublime, Atom, I just, Vim, TextMate, the list goes on and on, and they all have something great about them, but none of them are quite what I was used to from the Visual Studio world. But in the same sense, I liked the speed and efficiency of an editor. I didn't want a full IDE. So in a lot of ways, I was really uh, being selfish and saying, I, I would love to have a Microsoft-based back tool on a Mac platform being a, a node JavaScript developer these days. But I'm curious from you guys, what do you get out of it? I mean, yeah, you can talk to people now, but what's the benefit and what's going to keep you guys uh, delivering more features in this? It's funny. What's the benefit? The benefit is, you know, that we do get to go and talk to more audiences. It's pretty simple. At the end of the day, we would love it if people were building stuff that runs on Azure and they're storing their stuff in Visual Studio Online and all these different services that we offer, you know, consuming Office 365 APIs. You know, from Microsoft as a whole, that's what we would hope people do. But that's like step one, pants, step three, profit. Just to even get started, like we really want to just be able to have something and be able to go and engage more and more developers with tools that we traditionally can't offer or talk to people with. There's a long-term goal of, you know, we're hoping that people will use more of our APIs and our platforms. But quite honestly, right now, our goal and the benefit of it is that we're just able to talk to more developers. We can have that conversation. Because if I can have a conversation with you about the tool, then you know we can have another conversation later about something else, whatever that may be. But really, at this point, what we just want to be able to do is to offer up a better tooling experience cross-platform. Take Visual Studio where developers are, meet them where they are, not say have to say, hey, you know what, in order to use our tools and all this stuff that we have, you have to come to Visual Studio, you have to come to to Windows. In this day and age, that just doesn't work anymore. And so I think you're, you're seeing not only us, but you know Microsoft as a whole making this pivot where we're, we're reaching out and going where people are instead of saying, hey, you have to come to us. That's step one for us. And then we'll, we'll figure out what step two and step three look like. But really, we just want to make a connection with people and provide them a great tool. We want to be relevant to developers, yeah. right? So, and the developers today, they're not only Windows, right? They are on all kind of platforms. John said before, he, he's on the Mac since I don't know long. We want to be relevant to all of them. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. So Engage where, and connect. I mean, you're right now, you're right, guys are a preview. We always seem to wonder when is the release going to be? And then what features are on your roadmap and kind of what are you building towards? So we're at preview right now. I think there's a key set of things that we need to go and do. First and foremost is uh, finish up our extensibility story. So we released Preview without releasing an extensibility story because that's still being developed by Eric and the guys. But we wanted to get the tool out there and get it in people's hands so we can get feedback on the functionality and we can see where people want to extend it and start to have a conversation where we can, can get feedback on that. So that's the biggest thing that's on our 
roadmap, our backlog. From there, I mean, there's a million things that we can go and do and add to the, the tool. The trick is deciding what to put in and what to relegate to uh, another tool that's in the tool chain and not put it into Visual Studio Code. Uh, so I think at, at the end of the day, building another IDE that is three gig download or something is not what we want to do. So we're looking at, uh, we've got quite a big backlog of features that we want to go and add. And what we need to do is figure out what goes in the core of the product such that, you know, your great inner loop is enhanced by those things and the things that go in the core of the product that any extension would want to take advantage of. But outside of that, shipping things as extensions to the tool and then over time seeing what is popular or what should be in the inner loop and maybe elevating those or promoting those to be in the core tool itself. So um, number one is our extensibility model because that enables tons and tons of scenarios that, you know, we can't go and do everything on our own. So and it's, it's a well-proven model. And so from a timeline perspective, Eric, do you want to talk about timeline, what you're thinking? Well, timeline preview. Also, maybe one thing we should mention, you know, it sounds preview, but you work on this since quite a while. This is not, um, this code base has some mileage, right? So yeah. I think that's one point I like to make. And then I guess the goal we set us for the extensibility summer is that over summer, we want to really nail it. And it's not so that we have nothing, right? We didn't build this as a monolithic glob. Right. So if you look at the code structure, there is actually a plugin folder that has plugins in there. There's for each language you find a plugin folder. It's just that we take APIs very seriously, right? So and also the APIs and the development model. And there we just found we didn't have the maturity to release it at preview, but we're confident we can make great progress on that over the summer. One of the and, wild things that we've seen over the past week and a half is people actually going in and figuring out the plugin folder structure and then <laughs> starting to make modifications underneath the tool when we haven't even published anything. So it's been amazing. So the reverse engineering, the existing plugin set that comes with it. Yep. Yep. So well, it's, let's it's JavaScript, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can we take a, a quick step back too, just for remembering, you know, a lot of people haven't touched this yet. It's only been out for a week or so, but what are the main features or what are the main selling features of if I'm a developer and I use code, these are the things that I'm going to get or benefit from that really no other tool does as well as code. What are well, those things? I think we need to also start off with the feature that pretty much everybody cares about. And if you don't have it, nobody will talk to you about it. And that is Beans? multiple carrots. Multiple what? <laughs> multiple carrots. Multicursor, of course, yeah, which yes. we have. Yeah, we have that, yeah. Well, I think that's <laughs> it. Once you have that, everybody will use it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but everybody has it by now, right? There's actually one feature which we don't have multiple curves that you can easily select the next occurrence of a matching string, which we will add for for the next update. Kind of no, related but, to John's question, yeah. I'm going to just throw this out there, and it may color your answer a little bit, but you said that you don't want to change people's workflows too much, but it seems to me that if a tool does something really well, it's going to, and it's going to benefit them. It's going to change the workflow in ways that benefit them. So what kind of features are in just the core functionality of code before we add any plugins that are going to enhance people's experience. You see, one idea we have, because editors have one strength to support many, many different languages, right? So that's uh -huh. what the strengths of TextMate Sublime, you get coloring, you get all kind of stuff for them. And what we said, okay, coloring is great, but you want to go one level further. And how can we achieve consistency across all these languages? For this reason, we are not only an editor that gives you multi-cursor, we are also an editor that gives you kind of a, a language toolbox, right? How you show IntelliSense, how you do rename refactoring, how you do a reference indication, how you show parameter hints. And that's one of the things I think which also helps us to preserve consistency across languages and helps us as you then open this platform that others can, can contribute languages which behave and have the same features as we have built now, for instance, for TypeScript or, or C Sharp. That's kind of where we want to go to, right? You want to have that all languages are at the deep, at the very good level, not only coloring, but also IntelliSense, refactorings, reference searching, find all references and things like that. That's where we want to land in the end. If you look at our language support right now, right, we have three levels and not all languages are at that level. And that's also why we're so interested in the plugin architecture to help others, to help us to push more languages to the happy level, right? Yeah, we need our Haskell integration. Hey, about exactly. Something we enable, right? And that's another thing what you want to do is if you look behind the scenes, what the 
code is, it is it's really a multi-process architecture in the brain for TypeScript or the brain for C-sharp doesn't run in the same process as the UI. It runs in a separate process and talks to this process using a simple JSON-based protocol. Now, what this enables, right, is that the same brain can be used for different editors. Right. I think that's an interesting, also an open idea, right? So that you can use the same brain for different editors. And this is, in fact, what's happening. Like the TypeScript brain is also available in Sublime. If you really like Sublime better, you can use it in Sublime. But we use the same, we call it language server, in Sublime as in code, right? So that's kind of an, another interesting aspect of code. And for C Sharp, we use OmniSharp as the brain to give us this intelligence, which also is available for Sublime, Atom, Brackets, what have you. So we, we heard from Joe, and I, I agree with him, the multi-cursor is a big, <laughs> awesome feature that needs to be expanded. But what are those top, Chris and Eric, three to five features that you say are just the killer features for using code? So, I mean, for me, it's IntelliSense out of the box and cross a workspace IntelliSense, right? And so like, if I'm doing um, an ASP.NET v five application. I just get the rich IntelliSense experience powered by the Roslyn compiler, which is, you know, it's it's a it's an amazing API and we'll we'll see a bunch more come out of it, which is navigation, understanding, so like go to definition, find all references, things like that. So that's one big thing. The other big thing for me is debugging and being able to debug directly from within code. You know, I'm an old VB guy, and so having the ability to just hit F5 and break on your first line of code without ha- having to do anything is is a, a great sort of experience. Those are two key things for me. But the third key thing for me with code is sort of the lightweight IDE. Keep trying to say IDE just from a historical perspective, but it's a lightweight environment that's keyboard driven, right? So everything comes out of the command palette, and you can navigate and access the all the functionality of the tool through the command palette. It's lightweight. There's no toolbar. There's, uh, you know, just a, a simple folder view of your files. It's just a, a very simplified environment that lets you focus on what you need to focus on, which is writing your code, debugging it, and you have quick keyboard access to everything in the tool. So there's great IntelliSense things, but also the lightness and the keyboard access to me are, are key things of code. The other thing I would add is the project structure is just files and folders. Mm-hmm. It- it's not kind of a lot of meta files you need. Of course, you need meta files, like uh, what are the files in your project. But really, for you as a user, it's a very simple thing. You open a folder. We try to find the project context based on the folder uh, layout. So you'll find the project.json that ASP.NET finds, and we ask, is that the one you want to use? And we'll use this as the context to then be intelligent and provide intelligence across many files. But I agree with Chris, right? It's really the franchise functions he covered well before. But this in a consistent way across many languages, kind of. That's Mm -hmm. what I would add. So you guys have built, I mean, obviously I've used this for a little bit now. It's why I wanted to talk about this. But you guys have built a really cool editor. And I love how it works really well in the TypeScript world. So if you're using TypeScript, to me, honestly, I don't think there's a better editor that you can can use out there. And you guys can go check out the features online and see what's there. But what about in how the JavaScript world is working? What if I want to use Gulp with this? What if I want to use Grunt? If I want to tie in my Karma testing files, how does like all that integrate in with my current JavaScript workflow and what kind of features do I get there? So there is definitely no the existing tools like JSHint, uh, ESLint, no, uh, whatever you, you run for external tools or Gulp and Grunt. That's this task running integration you want to provide. You can describe what you do and how to analyze the output from it. And for that, you want to be fully open, right? So, and that's what we support. And that will also help as a JavaScript developer. One thing one has to realize, right? So you said it's the best tool for TypeScript. One reason why we built TypeScript is that it's very hard to build excellent tooling for JavaScript because you don't have type information to give you great intelligence experience, to give you find all references experience, right? So for that reason, there is, of course, gap when it comes to the level of support for TypeScript and for JavaScript, because that was the whole reason why TypeScript was built to enable intelligent tooling. So if that's where we're going, John. Yeah, I I think it is. And something that kind of blew my mind was when you were showing me some of the tooling and I was writing my code in Node or in Angular, all of a sudden I would get these green squigglies under the word Angular or under maybe Restify inside of Node. And by clicking a button there, it actually pulls down, tell me if I got this wrong, but it pulls down the d.ts files 
off the definitely typed GitHub site, and then puts it in a folder in my project, not in my distributed code, but just in a subfolder called typings. And then all of a sudden, the tool code now knows about all the types and the IntelliSense and hints in autocompletion for Angular and the client and like for RESTify on the server. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, you know, yeah, we couldn't talk about how we build it later, but the whole thing is built with TypeScript. And of course, we love writing a large code base with TypeScript. We have learned a lot along that. And for that reason, we want to leverage TypeScript to the maximum. So, and what's nice about TypeScript, one side product of TypeScript is that all of a sudden you get type information for libraries in a syntax, which is actually nice to write, right? So you don't need XML to describe what are the signature of jQuery or whatever. You get can really use TypeScript for that. So one idea was for us when you build the JavaScript tooling is also leverage all these artifacts we get from TypeScript development also for JavaScript. And that's how we get this .t.ts support and that we leverage this type information for libraries to make them available to you for JavaScript development. This has some limitations, right, when it comes to your own code, but I think the IntelliSense for libraries can go very, can be very rich and can be a very good experience, even for JavaScript by the fact that you have type information for libraries, because we all use libraries and we all forget APIs all the time, right? Yeah, that's what kind of blew me away is I'm sitting there typing and I don't remember the syntax for Angular half the time. I don't remember syntax for anything half the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just copy and paste. What was that before? And, you know, now I can just type in Angular dot controller and I get the syntax for what a controller method signature looks like and everything just kind of flows. And it's even more so for me for things like these node libraries that I rarely use. I use them like once every project, every couple of months and, now I'm getting intelligence in those things. And the key for me was I don't have to touch TypeScript. I mean, I like TypeScript, but if my project is all JavaScript, I'm still getting this tooling intelligence, which I never got before. And that's, that's really cool to hear. We were a little bit afraid, right? Because a JavaScript developer, how does he re- react to a .t.ts file? But obviously it's very easy and natural, right? Of course, there's some meta file, which makes my tool better. So I just take it and I'm happy and I go with it. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite features too. And even if I wanted to never write a line of TypeScript, I would get over it, over the idea of having a single comment line at the top that said some, actually not even in the top of the file. You can put it in a, someplace off screen. You don't even see it. And I had a single one in there that referred to a DTS file and I got some help. I'd pay that price any day. That's really a That's uh, cool. wonderful feature. And it looks like the Angular guys, also the development team, came to a similar conclusion. It's a good thing to have this typing information. So that's why Angular 2.0 is now also implemented in TypeScript, right? Which I was very happy to hear about. Yeah, I yeah. got to say, I switched over to code 100%. And by doing Angular 2 code recently in code, uh, in Visual Studio Code, wow, I hate saying code in code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by doing Angular 2 inside of your tool, I'll say it that way, it's really lit up a lot of features for me that I, it's made it easy. So I'm still learning the APIs for Angular 2, and it just automatically flows now through the tooling, which is uh, making it easier to learn new things. Yeah, it's kind of a gateway drug to TypeScript, actually, the the ability to (laughs) drop that reference in. It's a gateway drug. I like that. I want to talk about something in the workflow that you guys have described it on the site and so forth that I'm not seeing and I think I'd love to hear your thoughts on, and that's testing. And let me step back a little bit. When I think about Before I put anything in user voice, I ask myself the question, am I putting something in there that relates to something I do every hour of every day that I write code? If it doesn't fit into that, like it shows up in in any hour in which I throw a dart, then I don't think it belongs in VS Code. That's kind of my screen at the moment. So one of the things that's in there every hour is testing. And yet I'm not seeing in any of the sort of tutorials and so forth so far a kind of workflow around testing. And I'm not saying that testing belongs in the tool, but I'm curious about the workflow. No, testing is definitely part of the inner loop, but we kind of treat it the same way as building, right? It's a task you run, and of course you run it more frequently, like you run a build more frequently, you can run your tests more frequently. And for us, it's a task. And if you look at the test runners today, right, most of them are textual anyway, right? They run the test like Mocha or whatever, and they, they show we errors, they show we stack traces. So they fall in the same pattern of being a task that you run regularly. And we actually support that you can also have a special key binding to control shift T that you can, or command shift T that you can run a, a testing task easily. 
Right. Yeah, but do the, test, put... do the test results, the test failures flow back into VS Code in some way that I can then click on something and get to the line either of the test or something or other that, yes. that's the problem? So we should maybe document that a little more, but that's the idea, right? So a test failure is a stack trace, and you can define regular expressions, problem matches that will show up as links you can click and navigate to, for instance. Great. So it's just a documentation issue. That's all I'm it's, asking for. <laughs> it's a document. It, well, we have thought about it, but for us, no, we don't want to build a UI for test running, given that developers seem to like command line based text running UIs a lot or the browser based one. Right. No, so no, we'll completely be- get that. I'm only talking yeah. about that feedback cycle and how I can create a feed. If I saw an example of how you create that feedback cycle through okay, your own, we should, we should your that. own matchers and stuff so that I could build my own tasks and it could flow back in. Once I have that pattern and example of how to do it, I can use any test runner in the world and I'm okay. Yeah, I think that that's a good area. They call these things problem matchers, and I've Eric wrote me one for actually scanning the TypeScript output and then making uh, the output go into code so I could click on the lines. But I think that's kind of where there's a curve there. I hate regular expressions personally. So learning, first of all, the regular expression, I've got to go do that in it, and then just the, the code syntax to say, how does that problem matcher have to be defined? I think once that's there, that opens the doors to anything I run externally, I can then add those to the command palette to say, all right, I have these errors or issues that a command line tool gave me. Now go to this line in this file. Bingo. That's what's so powerful about VS Code, and we just have to learn how to use that power a little bit better. So okay. so yeah. that's that's my hope for you guys, or somebody, maybe the community. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's great. We, sh- we should do a doc on it. We have docs on how to do Node and ASP Net V5 and debugging, but we don't have anything on testing, so maybe I'll do that this week. <laughs> Does it have any specific features to support Angular 1 and Angular 2? Well, Angular 2, right, I think we covered, right? So because Angular 2 is done in TypeScript and they have .t.ts, they, they will not declare their stuff as beta before they have a .t.ts for their APIs and so on, and we support that fully. For Angular 1, if you do TypeScript, I, I think that's also the feedback we get from the Angular folks, right? We're in good shape. The question is what specific support we give you for JavaScript. And there we have added some Angular-specific support that you can at least get some IntelliSense on injected services. That's what we added. The challenge there is for a user, it's not always clear, right? When is there support when there isn't support? So there are some gaps there. Yeah, and you do get the, uh, is that Angular 1, you can't pull down the DTS files and get at least IntelliSense, but I think having it figure out what injected services you have and what those APIs are, that would be really key. Yeah, yeah but, I'm missing that. Yeah, that'd be great. What about things like uh, snippets and whatnot? Can you get Angular file templates and also inline code snippets working? So right now we have snippets that come with each language. They're closed. We will support user-defined snippets. And we have it as a hidden mechanism right now, which you don't want to document because you want to slightly change and make it more smarter. That's definitely something that will come. Yeah, we will support snippets. And then we hope that someone like John Papa adds a rich set of snippets for Angular into code. That's where I want to go. I'm all over that. Yeah, and I've got some weight in the wings for testing, too. On the debugging front, Chris, can you explain why I had problems debugging when I'm running code Against ASP.NET in Windows? Yeah, we don't. So we don't have debugging support for ASP.NET. So we have two target runtimes that we have debugging support for in the preview. One is Node, and that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And the other is managed code running on Mono on Linux and OS X. ASP.NET, so we're working with the, the core CLR guys to bring up debugging on that stack cross-platform. So I think there was a demo at Build where they showed a little bit of cross-platform debugging of an ASP.NET app in Visual Studio. And so we're working with those guys to get that exposed in a way that you know is out of process and we can consume it in code. But the reason we can't do it is because even on Linux or on uh, OS X is that the ASP.NET v5 apps are being compiled by the Roslyn compiler and uh, the debug metadata isn't being written out. There's nothing to debug. When you're on Mono, you can compile with a debug switch, and then there's a debug metadata in there, and we use the soft debugger API to be able to debug on those platforms. So it's just something that isn't available to us yet, but we're actively working on that. So the story is a little bit confusing about what you can do on what platform, but we'll get that nailed down here soon. 
Well, I only bring it up because I'm trying to use VS Code in Windows instead of Visual Studio because I like it. <laughs> so there's a kind of vote of confidence for VS Code. I really like it. And only the other day I was saying, well, let me try it. Oops, I can't. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. So, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. So, uh, but, you but know. The UI will be the same as for Node, right? That was the same idea. You want to have a consistent, exp- as you know, for Visual Studio across different languages, you have built the same debugger UI infrastructure that you can plug into different debug engines. Yeah. So once we get yeah. the core CLR debug, then sweet. we'll sweet. be laughing. Well, there's at least yeah. one person waiting for it. Well, you know, you guys solved a problem that a lot of us have been complaining about for years. We've been in that Microsoft inner circle, like Ward and I, and that's Visual Studio has become very bloated. It does everything for everybody, and they've been trying to trim it down and make it faster, and they've done a good job of that. But in the same sense, it's still an IDE, and it's always going to be an IDE. So this gives us an option in the Windows world uh, as well to work with Microsoft tooling or otherwise and actually move fast. So kudos on that end. But I don't want to let go of that. I mean, I'm telling you, I live in the Windows world a lot. And I was running Sublime and Brackets and WebStorm. And now, even though I have Visual Studio at my right hand, and still, now that I've got VS Code, I'm using VS Code because I like it. So that's a vote for VS Code, even if you're in the Windows world. Yeah, and to be clear, even WebStorm to me is too slow, Windows or Mac. So I love the fast and speed of Atom, Brackets, Sublime, and Code. To me, I put those four in that grouping. But I wanted to switch gears for a quick sec to talk about some of the features you guys have in the tooling that I, I just love. And when I discovered them, I looked like a kid in a candy store. So, like, you've got these things, and I might get the names wrong, but, like, there's a peak feature where you can hover over a function and then actually show a small little window that actually shows that code without losing the context of the file you're in. Yeah. Uh, and then there's refactoring and find references. And find all references was amazing to me. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah, I talk about Peak specifically. It's an interesting story behind Peak. And actually, um, there's Peak in Visual Studio, but we pioneered the whole Peak UI in the Monaco editor and Visual Studio online for Azure websites. And, and now, of course, it shows up for Visual Studio code. And the idea with Peak is that, you know, when you're scavenging your code and just trying to understand what things are, you don't want to constantly open up new files and clutter your environment. So we thought it'd be interesting if you could think about just being able to peek into whatever that code is behind that you know, method or whatever it is. Instead of overlaying, we basically just separate the code or we split the code at that point and we show you the file behind that, but just enough to give you a flavor of what's there. And so you can quickly see what's going on. You get enough landmarks presented to you in the peak where you can understand if that's someplace that you want to navigate to. And if you don't, you can just hit escape. It goes away and it doesn't take you out of the context that you were in. That tested quite well, and so we actually promoted that one even up to Visual Studio itself. And we use that for a lot of cases where we do things like right in line in the code, again, so that you're not overlaying what you're working on and you're not losing the context that you're in. If you're listening to this and you've never used VS Code or never seen Peak and you think, oh, that's in some of the other editors, I've never seen it in another editor, and it's one of the best features. So it's worth checking out. Cool. But there's a, meta, a pattern behind it, right? So I have to talk about patterns from time to time. So we found the way how you can keep things lightweight, if you pull them into the editor, right? So find all reference, don't open an, another window, or whatever, right? Just show it in context. Or if also these code length things, we, which we do for C sharp, right? Or the light bulb. As many things as possible, put them into the editor and not separate. And that's why I was think you can add, make an editor very rich without adding weight to the overall experience. So one of the other feature <laughs> I mentioned, which I thought totally was cool totally believe was, it. I totally believe it. It's sort of like the anti matter you know, don't do things modally if you don't have to. And it feels yeah, it yeah. feels like it's right there, not leaving. And half the time I'm not interested in opening up a new file and losing where I am. I, I just wanted to know how that thing works that I'm about to call. Yeah, what's cool about that is it's not just a little modal window. You can actually scan, like, let's say, let's put it concrete here. Let's say you're inside of a controller in Angular, and then you want to peek into the data service that it's using that's been injected. You can actually peek into that data service, keep the context of the controller, and actually scroll through and edit the data service in line as you're seeing a little window pop up. And then you can close it or control, or you can go right to that file. What I like, too, is, and I didn't realize until recently, is there's a feature called Find All References, which is kind of similar, where I could say, all right, I've got this data service, and I don't know where it's being injected. I'm about to change an API, and I can refactor it and make a change in every place, but before I do that, I want to see every place that's injecting this factory or service. So you can actually use Find All References to pull that up in a window, and it'll show you all the files and lines of code, and in the same kind of peak 
structure, it'll show you all the actual, like, probably 10, 20 lines of code from that file. And I find that immensely useful when I'm refactoring across an entire project of, you know, 1,000 files. So these are things I haven't seen anywhere else in the code editing world. All right. It seems like every time we ask Eric or Chris a question, John and I are talking about it, doing, doing fanboy on it, but still. <laughs> <laughs> we invited you guys here for a reason, not just to fanboy it, but there you go. <laughs> so let's talk about what we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we've kind of hit that. I know Lucas brought up the extensions, right? So the extensions have to be there, and they're going to have to Absolutely. come into play. The experience in C Sharp and in JavaScript right now, I know Chris pointed out some of the debugging isn't there yet for the ASP.NET features. I think the JavaScript side, it's good, but it can get better, right? There's got to be better IntelliSense or help for just plain old JavaScript, even without the for your own code, I would say. And we also found that people are not too unhappy with things like JS Hint, right? We built our own because we had at some point in our history on the browser. So, yeah, I, I hear that point. Yeah. ES6 would be nice. That will come in the next sprint, next deliverable, yeah, next update. So talk about that for a sec. How do people get the latest version of these uh, drops? So maybe as we develop as a team, right? So we work in uh, three-week sprints, and we just made our first drop available. We have an automatic update mechanism built in based on the infrastructure we're using now it's uh, we use a github's electron it comes also with a squirrel framework which gives automatic update and our plan is we work in these three-week sprints and at the end of the sprint we want to first make the drop available to early adopters or pioneers right they get an access to our development feed or stream of changes and they can get that one and once maybe one week later we will then switch over the automatic update uh, for everyone to the new version, right? So it will be a one week delay before, after we have stabilized uh, a sprint before everybody gets it. But you want to also get some sanity checking and stress reduction by having one week of stabilization by a smaller set of early adopters and pioneers. So when I signed up for your insiders program, did that put me on that track? Yep. You definitely get the privilege to be that. Yes. Maybe we make it available to everyone, right? But we hope that the insiders, it's, we hope that the insiders are willing to be early adopters. Yeah, that was as easy as clicking a button and say, "Yeah, keep me in." Okay, uh, right? Did I did I miss something? No, but well, at some point we will then tell you change the feed from which you want to get your updates, and that's just editing one JSON file. Then you get it. Nice. Is there anything else that we absolutely ought to cover that we haven't yet? Uh, I'm just wondering why people might use this one instead of Sublime. So there's a few things. The way we think about this, one is out of the box, you get great IntelliSense experience and you get a great debug experience. And we talked about sort of the limitations of the targets of debug at this point. But without having to do anything, without having to go download, you know, extra extensions, you know, we, out of the box, we have this great sort of end to end inner loop editing experience. So that's one reason, right? You don't have to go and, and configure things and set things up and figure out what works and what doesn't work. But at the same time, we talked a little bit about this. Briefly, we're building the tool and the components of the tool in such a way that if you're a Sublime user and you want to use or write ASP.NET v5 apps with managed code, then you certainly can go and do that because we have uh, you know, the OmniSharp plugin that we use in code also works in other editors. And so you know, we think that we offer a set of features and experiences which are better out of the box than other tools. But if you continue to use other tools but you leverage parts of the platform that we're building, and that's okay, too. And it goes back to sort of what we talked about very early on in the conversation, which was, you know, step one is we just want to be able to have conversations with, with developers and reach out to developers with a richer set of tooling than, than they have today. And getting, you know, outside of the Windows box or the Visual Studio box and saying, hey, you know what, all this tooling you know, should be available to anybody in their tool of choice. So we integrate into the existing workflow, and that includes an existing editor, or we provide a richer experience that integrates with the rest of your workflow. So you have the choice. Giving you choice, and I think we also help to make the choice, right? So actually, my team also contributes to these OmniSharp and TypeScript services, right, to make them better. If you want to, so actually, we will improve them, which also makes them better in Sublime, right, which really shows you we want to be open and we want to give you the choice. Of course, we hope you make the right choice. <laughs> We're not totally unbiased. All right. Let's do some picks. John, you want to start us with picks? Yeah, I'll start us off. So I'm going to be a little self-serving and open disclosure. There's a video up on the web that Chris and Eric did 
that uh, they invited me to do at Microsoft Build two weeks ago. And I thought it was a really great opening 15 minutes from Eric on kind of where Visual Studio Code came from and where it fits in that scale between editor and IDE. And it set the stage for, you know, did we develop this from scratch or did we lean on other tools that are out there? And I learned quite a bit about kind of how it came about and how it's built, which was really interesting to me. So I'll put that link in our chat window so we can put that up on the website, but definitely check out that video. And Chris and I also did demos in that, but Eric's part I thought was just superb for laying the groundwork out there. And if you want, my second pick will be if you want to learn more about Studio Code, the best thing you can do is go to their Visual Studio Code website, which we'll put a link to the show again. I think it's code.visualstudio.com. Yep. And they have a connect link. And on that connect link, they've got links to the program that Ward mentioned, Stack Overflow, for questions. They've got direct feedback. They've got their blog. So definitely you want to check that out. And my favorite part there is the user voice site where you can actually request features and vote them up. All right, Ward. Yep, so well, I second that uh, you should take an hour and go look at the build presentation by Eric, John, and Chris, which will uh, open your eyes. My second pick, I know a lot of Angular people are kind of curious about a related project called Aurelia uh, by one of the guys who used to be on the Angular team, Rob Eisenberg. And there is an interesting post on Aurelia and TypeScript, which I'll put in the show notes. And part of what makes it interesting is to see all the people who are voting for turning Aurelia into TypeScript, rewriting it in TypeScript, which the team is quite willing to do. They just want to know how the community felt. But that was an eye-opener for me, so check it out. All right, Katya, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, my pick for this week is the Blue Man Group, because I got to go and see them in Vegas. I saw them twice. Nice. Joe, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I'm going to pick NG Vegas. We just got finished doing that this last weekend, and it ended up being just a really great conference. I was really pleased with how it went off, and we had a party out of the pool, something you you don't normally see at a lot of conferences. So I was disappointed that nobody came and actually got in the pool, but it was actually a really, really great conference. I think it went really well. We had a lot of fun times, and there was a lot of really cool talks. So if you haven't watched any of the talks so far, definitely go and check out the talks from the YouTube channel. I'll put the link to it in the show notes. All righty. I've got a couple of picks. They're podcasts this week. The first one is the Code Newbie podcast by Saranya Bark. Really good. She's talked to a whole bunch of people. The last one I listened to was actually kind of a roundtable between her and one of the other people that was in the boot camp with her and Scott Hanselman. So that was kind of fun to listen to him talk about finding jobs and stuff like that. And the other pick that I have is called Ask Me Another. It's a kind of a game show, word, games. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. It's an NPR podcast, but don't hold that against it. Those are my picks. Chris, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I've got a couple here. There's uh, an Angular 2 dev preview talk by one of the guys at Google. He actually uses VS Code in there. That's one. There's a great TypeScript and VS Code blog post that Jonathan Turner did. And the third one, which we didn't talk about at all, is basically just Emmet. And we have Emmet support built into code. Eric actually did it, so I'm surprised we didn't talk about it at all. But uh, any place in your CSHTML files, your HTML files, you can do Emmet. So it's a very quick keyboard access to writing a bunch of HTML. So try it out. All right. Eric, do you have some picks for us? My pick is more of the build. We were kind of proud. No, we, we 12 hours, we're on top number one on Hacker News, which is also present, right? Short, what's current, ignoring the past, right? I guess now it's one week ago, so we're no longer relevant. So I took some days off uh, last week, and my pick is actually a book. It's The Computing Universe, A Journey Through a Revolution by Tony Hay and Curie Popeye. I, I like to read science stuff. Of course, the short is the better. And I really enjoyed kind of being away from this hacker news time, uh, three minutes on top or whatever, to just go through the computing history and reading again, you know, about hardware, software, algorithms, the amazing Turing machines, and so on. So that's my more old-fashioned pick. All right. Well, thank you both for coming and talking to us about this. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yeah. I think it'll be a terrific resource for people to go check out. And we'll wrap up the show. We'll catch you everyone next week. 
This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular dot com slash forum and sign up today.